Hello and welcome everyone to the Right Science Club. I'm Lorenza and I'm here today together with Elizabeth and Bing from the Rotterdam site of the Right Club. We're glad to see so many of you coming today for our seminar on errors in articles of erroneous articles. Uh, before starting the seminar, we will wait a couple of minutes uh, just to ensure that everybody who wants to attend has joined the meeting. And uh, we'd like to thank you all for coming today and also to thank the members of the Right Science Club who supported with the organization of the seminar. Um, and finally, a bit of an introduction to the Right Club to any of our newcomers. So um, the Right Science Club is a grassroots initiative that offers weekly seminar on reproducible, interpretable, open and transparent science. Uh, we operate at several sites across Europe and you can actually see in, the, in your screen our upcoming seminars and follow any updates uh, on these on our Twitter account and website. Uh, I think these were shared in the Q&A chat um, of the Microsoft Team event. Um, in case you also miss any of our talks, uh, they're all recorded and compiled on our YouTube account, so you can check that. Um, we also organize several initiatives that encourage the use of open research practices. Uh, in Rotterdam, we just had our first round of open research awards and the winners will be announced in the upcoming weeks. Just a bit of housekeeping before we introduce our guest speaker as well. Uh, you can ask your questions at any time during the talk. Uh, this can be done via the Q&A message board uh, and the questions will be moderated by Bing and Elizabeth. If you joined late, don't worry, you can pause, rewind and fast forward. Live events also has a fantastic auto subtitling feature. Uh, and now on to our main event and speaker. Um, Professor Burdorf is the head of the Department of Public Health at Erasmus Medical Center. Uh, with innovative, innovative methodology, he works on the determinants of population health, health related behaviors and in occupational health. He's also the coordinator of the Collaborative Academic Center, uh, which is where the knowledge of public health is shared with society to support the policies for a healthier community. His talk today is going to discuss retractions of scientific articles. Are they a sign of poor science and how do we deal with scientific mistakes? The floor is to you, Lex. OK, thank you very much. Uh, let's see if I can get my presentation going. Yes, that is perfect. Thank you. OK, good. Uh, and then I need to go back to yeah. OK, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation. Uh, especially because you have such a beautiful name, Riot. So um, thanks. Um, I will discuss a little bit uh, my experience in the past 10, 15 years with discussions about scientific integrity. And to make it a little bit more appealing, I want to raise the question that we all write articles and sometimes we make errors. But when are articles published that are really wrong and that shouldn't be published at all? And what are the discussions behind this? And um, so I will address three topics. So first I want to discuss a little bit about trends in, uh, in uh, erroneous articles, simply articles that shouldn't be out there. And what is happening there and um, what are the trends and, and, and uh, what are the debates? And then secondly, I want to discuss a little bit the publication culture, because I think that is linked with the, with the big debates we have about scientific integrity. And then, of course, I want to challenge you as participants. You know, what is your responsibility here? What can you actually do? And, uh, and during my talk, I will invite you to uh, to contribute, you know, either use the Q&A or, you know, um, but I want some opinions of the audience as well. So let's uh, kick off with a few images that uh, attracted at least me as a as a scientist. 
So uh, the first one with this placard, science isn't, you know, just like your opinion, man. That's from a, a science march. So scientists marching in the US to promote uh, the role of science in society. You know, isn't that fantastic? I wouldn't have dreamt of it 20 years ago that scientists would go to the street. So that's a fantastic development. And I especially like this sign because it it is drawn basically from one of my favorite movies, The Big Lebowski. If you haven't heard about it, Google it. Uh, Big Lebowski is uh, a trending topic almost every week in the US because the movie is full of fantastic quotes. And this is the original quote from uh, the movie. Um, Lebowski is the, uh, the figure on the left. Um, if you have time, watch the movie. It's, it's full of uh, Fantastic advices. Uh, uh, the second picture that drew my attention was in Dutch. A farmers march. So they they march from all over the Netherlands in their in the tractors and they march to the National Institute of Public Health, where a lot of my friends work. And the headline of one of the uh, daily newspapers was RVM commits. Uh, suicide on farmers and it all had to do with the uh, nitrogen figures and um, the decision by a court in the Netherlands that uh, nitrogen figures were too high and um, it was impossible to expand farms but also to expand building sites. Um, and the farmer simply said we do not trust the science behind this model. So we don't trust RVM and we're going to tell it. So we drive to RVM, we block the road for two days and uh, and then of course there was a debate in a, a debate center in Amsterdam called the Bali where it says science is just an opinion <clears throat> and that's probably something that you all have heard. Um, so science is going through a kind of uh, identity crisis. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's for me, it is actually linked to science itself. So this is a fantastic article about the retraction index. It's the rate of articles that are being retracted versus the impact factor of a journal. And this um, is, yeah, the interpretation is difficult, but look at the retraction index. So in the New England Journal of Medicine, when the uh, article was written 10 years ago, about almost four articles per thousand articles, four on a thousand were retracted somewhere down the line. Um, and the authors here claim that uh, the retraction index is uh, linearly associated with the impact factor, and that gives you two interpretations. Uh, the authors say, well, maybe these journals with high impact factors are too eager to publish cutting edge science, and they uh, have to pay for it with a high retraction. Uh, some of the editors of these journals replied and said no, because we have such a high quality, we continuously evaluate the publications we have published and hence we have a higher retraction. That's interesting. Um, then of course, you probably have heard about this story, Elizabeth Big, Dutch name, um, and she has this remarkable capacity. It's really remarkable. She looks at an image and she immediately spots there is something wrong with the image. And, um, and now she is an image hunter. That's her profession. She goes to especially biomedical literature 
and she spots images that are not correct anyway, that are duplicates from previous images. And, uh, and she keeps track of it and uh, According to this uh, this newspaper article in, in in Nature, isn't that amazing that Nature writes about her? Her discoveries had led to at least 172 retractions, and um, and this is one of her key articles where she showed in all the journals that she investigated approximately four to five percent of the images were manipulated. So it's 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 actually falsification. Um, and interestingly, uh, higher impact journals have less fabricated images. So here we maybe see indeed something happening that if you have a high impact factor, you probably are a bigger journal, better staff, you have more possibilities to uh, to look at it, but I think this is an extremely worrying trend. Four percent of the papers have images that are, you know, somehow manipulated. Um, then another interesting source of information. So once you you dive into the literature, you know, you see all these uh, interesting publications. So this was a publication. Uh, published a couple of years ago where the authors uh, in gynecology and obstetrics uh, did an evaluation in, um, I think they looked at 20 journals and the retraction in these 20 journals. And, um, <clears throat> and there are a couple of uh, astonishing facts, I think. So first, if you look at the figure, the article publications and retractions by years. So um, let's look at the yellow because those are the retracted articles. And you see an increase from 2010 onwards. You see a peak in 2015, but I have to warn you, the latency period between publication and retraction is on average three, four years. So 2018 just reflects and the fact that uh, probably if you rerun the analysis now, that would be much higher. So it is actually in the last four or five years that journals have become much more aware of uh, scientific integrity and in the publications. And then if you look at table two, this is I think one of the first articles that tries to identify what are the causes for retraction. And roughly uh, the first category has to do with the, the content. And that's 72 percent. Um, and on top of it is uh, plagiarism. 22.7 uh, percent. And plagiarism is indeed a problem. I'm an uh, editor in chief of a journal, and uh, sometimes when I read manuscripts, um, it's almost, you know, too nicely written that you think, you know, that. So you check and you see indeed that people easily copy text from others. But there is also an underlying debate. So. I am an author of two papers where editors accused uh, the first author of plagiarism. And the first time it happened, it was really, um, yeah, I think worrisome. The journal had sent uh, a letter to the PhD student. She was from Colombia uh, to me, to the head of the department and to the dean. And they stated that there was uh, plagiarism in the manuscript and uh, that they would prohibit uh, the research team for the next five years of access to their journal. So imagine, you know, you are a PhD student from Colombia, you go through the roof, you know, think, what have I done here? And 
the head of my department, he was very cool about it. He said, ah, you know, let's look into the details and see what happens. And it turned out that in the material and methods, the plagiarism appeared to be the description of the questionnaire. And she had published another paper and uh, and she copied basically the description of the questionnaire. <clears throat> And then I started to ask around what is plagiarism and um, luckily the Royal Academy of Science in the Netherlands had written an advice. Um, and they raised the issue that if you copy descriptions in the methods from yourself. That was called self plagiarism that that is a strange term because you cannot, uh, you know, uh, do plagiarism on yourself. And they actually quoted uh, the American Society of Psychology. Um, and that society had published guidelines and in the guidelines they stated, um, well, plagiarism does not relate to material and methods where authors cite their own work. <laughs> So I wrote a lengthy letter of complaint to the editor of that journal and uh, to cut a long story short about uh, half a year later. They uh, published the paper. In that journal, they didn't make a formal excuse, which annoyed me a little bit, uh, but at least the PhD student was very happy that she published the paper in a good journal and that she wasn't accused of plagiarism. Um, so be aware of it. This is kind of controversial and it is difficult to see what the plagiarism is here actually. Then the second reason is errors in data. Often <coughs> caused by authors themselves because they write to a journal and they say, well, hey, sorry, we have discovered an error and now the results are different. Can you publish uh, an erratum? And that is very annoying. Uh, the third reason is duplication that you publish almost a similar paper with few figures differently. Uh, the worrying category is of course the fabricated and falsified data. That that is amazing that. Um, and then I would like to draw your attention to the administrative reasons. Um, international institutional review boards, that's the medical ethics. That is sometimes a reason, but the highest category is uh, compromised peer review. The um, the most amazing story I ever heard was uh, some journals ask for suggestions. You submit your manuscript and they ask for suggestions of peer review. And there was this one g guy in the US who then um, proposed three different persons. And actually he had set up an email system for these three fake persons. And then if the journal would send a request for review to these persons, he would write brilliant raving reviews and he would get into the journal. And he was called after three or four times and that was published in the US. Um, so this happens. Um, but as an editor, you know, I have been involved a couple of times in authorship disputes. Which from a journal point of view, that's that's very annoying that the manuscript is being sent to you and you handle the manuscript and uh, you, you know, you publish the manuscript and then someone reads the manuscript <coughs> and writes you. Hey, but I was I was a researcher working on this project. And I'm part of the research group and my name is not on it. Um, and sometimes apparently journals decide to uh, retract the article uh, because uh, of abuse of authorship. It also, there is also a case where uh, a group of authors used 
very famous names and just put them on the author list without telling the very famous person that he was an author and that increased the uh, the likelihood of being uh, accepted and of course th that famous person found out that he had authored papers that he had never seen so he wrote to the journal and they were retracted so lots of stuff going on where uh, authors behave unethically um, for a wide you know array of yeah reasons um, and that's a worrying trend <coughs> The other worrying trend is, and excuse me for the topic, because I think this will never go away. This was uh, an article published in 2015, and it was officially retracted four years later. And you can find the whole story in the Retraction Watch database. If you Google that, it's a fantastic database of two researchers who keep track of all these stories. And this is an interesting story, but um, it was published in, uh, in uh, a scientific journal, Archives of Sexual Behavior. And apparently uh, the authors claim through a kind of experiment that if women wear high heels, then uh, men behave differently. They are much more likely to fill out a questionnaire if they are being asked to do so. Um, and that was, of course, you know, in many, many newspapers around the world, you know, they, they, they published these funny stories. And then a few years later, you know, it, it turned out that it was partly faked and, and the analysis was, was, was completely wrong. Um, but these stories will never go away. And you probably know about the famous story about autism and vaccination, where uh, there was a, an article that was retracted. I think it was New England Journal of Medicine. And the story is still out there that if you are vaccinated as a child, you have a risk, increased risk of autism. So, it is really, really serious, I think. Um, <clears throat> so to wrap the first part up a little bit is, is uh, luckily there is an increasing attention for uh, erroneous articles. Uh, retraction rates go up. Uh, there is in general a growing concern of, re you know, reproducibility of research especially in psychology i think they they really went through a big identity crisis a couple of years ago where all the classical experiments were reproduced and then i think 80 percent couldn't be reproduced um so in some disciplines it is uh it is a really big debate um and I think the worrying trend is that once you've published an article with a wrong conclusion and it is picked up on the internet, the message will stay forever. Um, so um, my basic question when I look at this, you know, what is driving people to do this? Because as a researcher, you should always, you know, try to do your best and not publish, you know, stupid things. Um, so what is driving this behavior and, and, and maybe, you know, if you want to share some observations or have some questions, use the Q&A now so I can pick it up uh, as I go along. Um, so actually research integrity now is a research topic. There are research groups that are uh, investigating scientific integrity. Um, <laughs> And let you give you an example of my own department. So I'm blaming a lot of other people now, but let's look at my own department. So this is the story. So uh, one of the PhD students was uh, working on a project in, with, with a, a very experienced group of researchers. And, uh, you know, she worked for a year on the paper and then uh, the paper was published and uh, she started to work on a second paper and uh, her colleague went through the SPSS files and uh, raised a question about the key variable country of birth. 
And apparently there was a stupid coding error. Errors that we all make. And then, you know, the position went back to the first publication and she she went to a supervisor and she said, yeah, you know, we have this coding error and uh, we are now reporting inaccurate results. What, what should we do? Uh, and that's an interesting question because, you know, you can remain silent and no one will know. And uh, so we had a, a quite an intense debate in the department with many people involved and uh, also people from outside. And eventually the evaluation of the problem was that, yeah, the variable was country of birth and they were studying mortality patterns and that is a sensitive topic. <clears throat> And um, and of course the results that you know it will be used by others. It may even appear in systematic reviews. So um, you know we need to rectify the article. It is wrong to have this information out there. Uh, the lessons we learned is, uh, for example, never have one single person doing the coding and the data cleaning and the checkups him or herself. Um, so in our internal audit system, we have, we actually ask questions about this. Um, what happened is that uh, the last author, Professor uh, Kuberg, he made the bold decision to retract the article. So we wrote to the journal and he said, you know, given the sensitivity of mortality patterns in migrants, um yeah you know we we have to retract the article because of the coding error and um can we submit resubmit the article with the correct information and the overall conclusions will not be changed dramatically but the actual figures will change um and the journal refused and uh, they said well you know Basically, you made a mistake, so it's your problem. We retract the article. And uh, it was picked up by the Retraction Watch database, and you can see the story there. And, uh, and basically what the Retraction Watch database uh, says is, well, this is, this is transparent. Researchers notify the error and they go to the journal and uh, so this is what you should do. Uh, there was an updated version. They added a couple of years of um, information on mortality. So they rewrote the article slightly and eventually it was published in another journal. And the editor of the other journal was, was notified of this whole story. And he said, well, you know, if you're sure that these are the correct data, I think it's important information now, so I want to publish it. <coughs> um, so, yeah, retraction can also be, you know, an error. It's not always that there is messy science. It was simply an error, so be aware of that. Um, so why is you know, this debate about retraction, we see more articles being retracted. Why is this happening? And the current debate, I think you all recognize it's the uh, science. Is it the team performance or an individual performance? Um, I think we try to move away a little bit from the individual performance to team science, but it is uh, very difficult. It also had to do, it also has to do with recognition and rewards. How are you being evaluated in your annual appraisal? Uh, probably how many articles uh, will be your first question and, and, you know, and the recognition and rewards should also be for other activities in science. And then we have the open science movement uh, that basically says, you know, everything we do should be transparent and open and that's, what you also want to achieve with the riots. And then we have the discussion on research waste. 
that is a brilliant marketing term of a research group that 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 wants to push the you know agenda on research integrity um so some reflections my personal experience on the debate on research waste and and parameters for evaluation and transparency <laughs> So research waste, it started about uh, seven, eight years ago. And one of the seminal uh, articles, it's basically an editorial, a commentary, was published in The Lancet. And, um, and this is uh, the first three lines from that article. So this is where it's all about. So the uh, research group went through uh, uh, the literature and they identified in a particular year 2005 all studies on cancer prognostic markers and then they uh, evaluated you know 1575 scientific reports and 96 percent of these reports reported at least one significant prognostic variable indicating a little bit that uh, this is p-driven research. Um, and then 2005 is interesting because this is from 2014. They actually took six, seven years after 2005 to evaluate how many biomarkers were confirmed in subsequent research. And the next question, how many actually uh, entered routine clinical practice. Well, the confirmation in other research was extremely limited, a few percent. And even less ended up in clinical practice. So their basic conclusion was, well, initially promising finding uh, cannot be reproduced and they do not improve healthcare. And they raised the question, is this the way we conduct science? <clears throat> and this is the famous figure from this article, avoidable waste. You know, if we, we want to live in a sustainable world, then avoidable waste is terrible. <laughs> um, and look at the categories. So they regard as avoidable waste, a publication where the research question actually has no priority. Um, so they argue that almost 50% of the studies uh, are done and we can, they argue that we can do without these 50% because they have no relevant questions, they do not add anything to uh, important uh, <coughs> research topics, debates. So already 50% is gone. And then they uh, also say, well, you know, if we look at adequate steps to reduce bias, we estimate that uh, almost 50% of the studies that are left, they are not adequate. <coughs> so you have already thrown out 75% of all the literature in the world. And then uh, the next one, which is also very interesting, <coughs> they say um, it's not a very efficient process if you redo a particular survey. Because if someone has done the survey and these data would have been available, you could have answered your research question in data that are already available. So why do you collect them? again and then uh, they also argued and that's a little bit different argument is that uh, <clears throat> they also did a very interesting uh, study where they went through a funding agency and they asked the uh, official uh, applications and then they looked at the publications uh, five six years down the line and uh, and they argue that, and I think there is empirical evidence from uh, several areas, that authors themselves are biased. 
So they do a study and they don't find interesting results. And then they don't put in the effort to get these so-called uninteresting, disappointing results published. So what you see in literature is actually the few things that point into the direction, hey, Eureka, we have a new, new idea. Um, so authors themselves are actually to blame here. And then, of course, they also looked specifically at RCTs and uh, yeah, and that really is annoying that uh, the protocol is being published. It's written in the protocol. The primary outcome measure is blah, blah, blah. And the secondary outcome measures are blah, blah, blah. And then they look at the publication and then the primary and secondary outcome measures are sometimes switched. The primary outcome is not reported. Um, yeah, all, all this stuff is happening. Uh, so they basically said there is too much waste in research. And uh, in another article, they state that 80% of the research publications, in fact, is waste. 80%. So if you publish your thesis with five articles, then on average, four out of five is waste. <laughs> That wouldn't be a nice message if you defend your thesis from a committee member. No, you wouldn't accept that. But that's the debate we have. So, um, and I think it's partly linked to the publication culture we have. So, uh, to our parameters of evaluation, the Hirsch index. That's fascinating. That is a two page article in Science or Nature, I forgot, by uh, a physicist, Hirsch, published in 2014, and in 2015 it was already implemented in uh, important databases. And if something is implemented within one year, then the idea is so appealing that everyone starts to use it. And I still remember that uh, when it was introduced in Web of Science, you know, my colleagues and I, we started to send around emails, you know, what is your age index? Uh, we were interested. And, um, and I see it happening at the Rasmus MC also. You know, it sometimes seems to be that if you want to publish your thesis, uh, it needs to be as thick as possible. Um, as if you do better science with the thesis of 300 pages than if you have 150 pages. So even within Erasmus MC, we should definitely shift more from quantity to quality. You see it if the order of the authors, that's an official evaluation criterion, especially in biomedical sciences. We know well, in medical sciences, I should say. We know in, in medical sciences, first, second, and last author. We, th that's what you want. And uh, a funny story is uh, I once was uh, working together with a group um, of, um, I think it was actually the Department of Management Studies at the University of Nijmegen, so a completely different area. And, uh, and one of my uh, postdocs, she went to a meeting and they discussed the order of the uh, authors on a particular paper. And the rule in their department of management studies was that the first author uh, is the one who has done most of the work. And then subsequently, with less impact in the paper, uh, you have a lower priority. So my postdoc came back and uh, said, well, it was a hard negotiation, <clears throat> but they thought that you were probably going to contribute the least, so they put you as last author. <laughs> and for us, that would be fantastic because the last author has a completely different uh, yeah, appreciation. So, and then you probably have seen the trend of shared authorship 
you know, it started with the first two authors sharing, and now I see papers with the first three authors and the last three authors sharing equal authorships, you know. Um, and I think it's probably because we have these websites like Scopus, Web of Science, you can evaluate this very quickly and you get an idea about the quality of a person. <laughs> Um, and then it makes sense to be on as many papers as possible. Um, yeah, this is this is a, a, the, uh, yeah this is a very interesting uh, a table. <coughs> so this is a table in an article published in a, a good journal, American Journal of Epidemiology. And uh, in this table, there are seven publications on one particular topic. Uh, does job strain at work is a risk factor for coronary heart disease? So cohort studies. So, um, and then look at the relative risks. So it varies from 2.2, highly significant, 1.94, 1.57. So three significant studies and four non-significant studies. And then you look at the number of citations. The study with the highest relative risk has the most citations. So authors like to pick the study with the highest relative risk. Interestingly, that study was published in the journal with the highest impact factor. So maybe journal with a higher impact factor are more likely to publish papers with significant higher results. And then there was a systematic review conducted and a quality score is in the last column and uh, the study with the highest relative risk actually received the lowest quality. Um, so isn't this an interesting analysis? And the best part of the story is that this paper was written by Kivi Maki. The first author of the first study. So he reflects on this as a scientist and he said, you know, it cannot be true that my paper is cited more often than other papers. Uh, and in fact, it has the lowest quality score. So what is happening here in science? So that's a nice example of a, a scientist with, with good critical reflection on his own work. <laughs> Then uh, a couple of years ago, this created uh, a huge uh, debate, also at the Rasmus Medical Center. And some of you may actually have read uh, the contribution. Uh, Joannidas, he is a well-known researcher. I think he publishes probably 50 papers a year, but uh, not 72. Uh, he's very critical. He's also involved in this research waste debate. And he actually had access to one of the big databases. I think it was uh, Scopus. And, uh, and the database contains 12 million authors. 12 million authors. Then he said, well, I'm going to select all authors with at least five publications in the database. And then he went down to 1.5 million. And then he selected the 100,000 authors with number of publications. And then he did an analysis on the 100,000. <coughs> and he noted that 86% uh, of the authors with more than 72 papers in a year are in one particular discipline, physics. And in physics, you have publications where the author list actually exceeds the word count of the article. And that's because they work in these huge consortia. Um, really huge. But they also noted an interesting 20-fold increase in 15 years in people who publish a lot of papers. So that tells you a little bit about trends. And then in this article, <clears throat> there is a very small paragraph 
and that really hit a nerve at the Rasmus MC because it turns out that uh, hyper prolific authorship seems to cluster in particular organizations. And the Rasmus MC was specifically notified as an organization with a high cluster of hyper prolific authors. And in fact, seven out of nine are from the same department. So there is definitely something like a culture in departments that uh, yeah, that gives rise to uh, these kind of uh, trends. Um, I think 72 really is a lot. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Transparency. <clears throat> so if we think about, you know, the things that I've uh, told you that, you know, should be published everything, especially in the COVID, you know, the Met Archive, lots of things were published there. Um, and to me, it's a question mark. Because there is simply too much science around. Uh, it's impossible to keep track of it. So you can publish everything on Met Archive. Who's going to read it? And and uh, so that's a, for me a question mark. Uh, another trend of a couple of years ago was that, uh, especially the BMC journals, open access journals, uh, started this. They would um, show the peer review process and everything else completely uh, transparent names information so you can uh, track uh, the first submission the peer review reports the the changes the auto making you can check it all um i was a keynote last year uh, in denmark and i was introduced by uh, a researcher who told me that i had actually reviewed her first paper and she quoted from my review report because she could find it on uh, the BMC Public Health Journal. And luckily I was kind of supportive, but very critical. So I got away with it. But I think that's interesting. You know, who is using this information? And then the latest development, I wasn't aware of it, but one of my uh, colleagues mentioned it, that there is this idea of uh, registered reports. So you publish your study protocol and you sub, well, you actually submit your study protocol to a journal and then the journal decides if the study protocol is OK. We are going to publish the study. If you have carried out the study. So based on the protocol, they make a decision and I think for randomized controlled trials, you could argue that that could make sense, but for observational studies that would my in my opinion be a little bit too far, but you know, who knows? It's an interesting debate. And then we also have this development of open data repositories that you should submit your data with your manuscript and then uh, have it in an open data repository for everyone else to use your data. Um, and that also gives, you know, interesting questions because uh, how much of your data should be open if you run a generation r birth cohort then you would definitely not want to put all your data out on the internet for everyone uh, you have spent 10 million euros to collect it and then you have all these phd students from everywhere in the world scrutinizing these data sets and then they write the brilliant publication that you were going to write so uh, this is i think an interesting development also you know how far should we go but definitely i think open data repositories will become much much more uh, important um and then to to wrap up my lecture is um yeah, I think every scientist should critically reflect his or her behavior with regard to scientific integrity. Uh, and I'm teaching authorship in the 
in the course of research integrity. As PhD students, you have this mandatory course. And uh, and I'm one of the uh, teachers there, together with a whole bunch of other uh, researchers on authorship. And I'm sometimes astonished about the debates about authorships within Erasmus Medical Center. So, and also sometimes astonished by the way that PhD students themselves, you know, reflect on it. So there is definitely, you know, a lot of discussion needed to be much more critical on uh, on authorships. And linked to that, so of course I'm an established researcher, so for me it's easy. Uh, um, I refuse quite a few authorships. <coughs> because I feel that I have not contributed enough. Um, but I think more people should do this. And then reversely, uh, with my PhD students, I always ask myself the question, is there any expert in my network in the Erasmus Medical Center that knows a lot about this and that can improve the study? And if that's the case, then I approach that person uh, sometimes when we have a draft manuscript, um, and that's very interesting because usually such an expert will go over the manuscript and, 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 and will give you free advice. Usually they don't want to be an author because they, you know it's free advice, uh, but sometimes they make very good remarks that we have to rerun some of the analyses and they become part of the, of the authorship group. So. Um, I think that's something as a PhD student you should ask yourself, you know, is there expertise that can be helpful outside my research group to improve my paper? Um, and that's a difficult question sometimes to raise, but I think it's uh, it's essential if you want to increase research integrity. And then, yeah, basically my advice also is try to contribute to your research environment. It's not about you alone, it's about your research environment, your research group, your department, Erasmus Medical Center. Uh, and I truly hope that the younger generations of researchers uh, take these debates forward and, 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 uh, and increase research integrity uh, to the next level. And that's the end of my lecture. And I leave it here because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's an invitation for you to contribute. <laughs> that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you a lot uh, for that very interesting talk. I think for me, uh, when you showed the first image uh, with uh, science isn't, you know, just like your opinion, <laughs> that was already a brilliant start for me. And I think we agree on a lot of things that you said so for example it was very reassuring to hear uh, that you think we should shift more more towards the quality of theses than the quantity so not only having very lengthy but also qualitatively high standards for the thesis uh, but also some things that we could uh, talk a bit more on because I am one of the people that uh, has a registered report under submission for a non-RCT. <laughs> Ooh, that will be an amazing experience, I think. Yeah, good. Yeah. It absolutely is indeed. Um, but what I wanted to ask you first, and of course, everyone in the audience, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A, then we can uh, address them. But I want to start off with a question about, uh, you talked about the authorship lists, and especially that in physics, they can become quite large. Uh, but this is something that we also see in medicine, I think, namely in the consortia. Yeah. And I was wondering, what is your opinion about this? So are these huge author lists the way to uh, acknowledge the contributions of everyone? Or should we think of an alternative way uh, for acknowledging the contributions that people have made? Yeah, that's a tricky question. I, t I actually tend to go for the second option. So, <laughs> but it depends a little bit on the research area and who is involved. So if you do a clinical study and you have uh, 12, hospital in, uh, 12 hospitals involved, I think it is part of your uh, professional behavior in a hospital that you contribute to scientific development. And hence it is part of 
uh, let's say your your daily work, and that should not be reflected necessarily in authorships. Um, and the same is true for you know I work a lot with uh, with organizations outside uh, outside the hospital, public health organizations, and there, you know, I have the same uh, philosophy. So if I work uh, together with people and they really contribute, I usually tell them, you know, I would like you to be on the paper, but you have to contribute. And the contribution starts for me with the conceptual design of the study. And the rules for authorships in my department specifically stipulate you should be part of, let's say, the group who is discussing about the design and the conceptualization of the study. It's not enough to get a draft and reflect on the draft. So we are already shifting a little bit that you are involved in the whole process of doing research and then uh, you limit the number of authors, um, but it gives you a little bit of freedom if someone has made a essential contribution in the statistical analyses, then I would be tempted to ask that person as a co-author. But I don't like this consortium structure where you, know, you have collected information on five patients and then you are an, uh, an author. That's something that I would refute. Uh, and that's happening in physics, you know, you are an engineer and you work on, you know, running uh, the machinery. That's your job. Um, and I think they should not put that person on the auto list. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that is um, at least solid advice for if we get offered this opportunity. Um, actually, Fabio has a uh, follow up question on this. Uh, so he writes cooperating is important, but if we take part in a big consortium, it is hard to have control on what is going on. For example, someone else may make up their data. How can we protect ourselves from this? Any advice? Whew. Uh, yeah, it's a, I, I don't want to advise that you should actually all ask to, to see the data yourself and all the authors to check the data because that's not how it's going to work. You, you know, you, you must trust your colleagues. I think that's essential. But uh, that's a rule number one for me is that you never do research on your own. So any analysis you do have someone involved checking the analysis very carefully. Um, and the second is um, share your tables and all the information timely because experienced researchers, at least as my experience, if I look at the tables, I can pick up many, many analytical mistakes or figures that don't seem right because the standard deviation is too high, uh, things like that. So someone with experience can actually <clears throat> pick up mistakes, uh, raises questions about uh, analytical strategies. Um, and then again, if you work as a PhD student with, with, with one supervisor, then of course, you know, you have this kind of problem that you can walk into an alley. And that's where the consortia are really very helpful uh, but my advice would be in the consortia, you know, I've recently worked with four groups internationally and I've asked in each group some person to specifically do particular activities like, you know, checking uh, the tables uh, because I really want a good discussion and avoid that someone makes a mistake down the line and that 30 people don't notice the mistake. That would be very embarrassing <laughs> for the consortium. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that answer. I think indeed if you're working with large groups of people, it can sometimes get tricky because you cannot all 
check everything and yep. it's everyone's responsibility, then it can be missed also by everyone. And I think it will be reassuring for people working within consortia if they know uh, who is actually going to check, uh, for example, the code or whether the data was processed correctly. And then you know that the other ones don't have to do to take on that responsibility. Thank you. I'm looking at my screen and I see that we already uh, reached the uh, four hour mark. Uh, so I think we're going to have to wrap up, uh, wrap up so that we don't keep everyone too busy. Uh, but I would like to thank you again for a very wonderful talk. And uh, Lorenza, I'm, I'm looking at Lorenza and Bing. Do you have anything that you would like to say? Just don't forget to tune in to the right science .co.uk website for our upcoming events. Thank you so much for joining. All right, perfect. Then I'm going to end the live stream here. Thank you everyone for joining and hope to see you next time.